Well, we are studying the book of Numbers, and we're dealing with chapters 26 through 31. For those of you just joining us, our earlier sessions covered the camp of Israel in the first couple of chapters, the tabernacle, then the preparation of the camp of Israel. Then this very, very critical move from Sinai, Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea. It took uh, 40 hours to get Israel out of Egypt, and it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And uh, so we don't remember that failure. After that failure, they journey to the plains of Moab, and then the last session we were in, the previous session, we had a number of topics. It was pretty packed. We had talked about the brazen serpent. We also dealt with two enemies that were defeated, Sion the king of the Amorites and Og the king of the giants, as he's typically called. We then we encountered this strange character called Balaam, who was hired by King Balak of Moab to uh, curse Israel. And then we had a closing incident with the idolatry. Balaam, advi even though he wouldn't curse Balak as Balak wanted to, he did counsel him as to how to defeat Israel by getting them into idolatry and fornication with strange wives, which they did. And they are, are they going to pay for that? In this session, we're going to talk about their pre preparations to enter the land. That'll happen after uh, Moses dies and Josh takes over, but they're getting ready for that. Then we have chapter 27, and I haven't found one commentator in dozens that gets it right. So we're going to talk about this strange technical exception in the Torah about the daughters of Zelophehad. Then we're going to have two chapters on the feasts of Israel, the spring feasts, essentially, in chapter 28, and the fall feasts in chapter 29 that we're right in, we happen to be into right now as we speak. Then there's a chapter on some law of vows, and then they take vengeance on the Midianites, and I think we can get through that tonight to prepare ourselves for the final session next time. So Numbers 26 is where we're at. It came to pass after the plague that the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward throughout their father's house, all that were able to go to war in Israel. This is the second census. Remember the book opened with the first census, and we went through all those tribes and families. We get to do it again. I'll try to be brief with it so you get the picture, but they're taking a second census. So we had a snapshot of the 600,000 plus from the first census, and we're going to find out that what, the, what it looks like after these 38 years of wandering in the wilderness. And Moses and Eliezer the priests spake with them in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Take the sum of the people from 20 years old and upward as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt. And then we go through each tribe as we did before. Reuben, the eldest son of Israel, the children of Reuben, was Hanuk, of whom the family of Hanukites, and Palu, the family of the Paluites, and Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, and Carmi, the family of the Carmites. These are the families of the Reubenites, and they that were numbered of them were 43,730. And then it gives the sons, then it gives the details of those sons. The sons of Palu was Iliab, the sons of Iliab was Nemuel and Dathan and Byram. Now Dathan and Byram will ring familiar because you remember that this is that Dathan and Byram which were famous in the congregation. <laughs> Infamous might be a better term. Um, who strove against Moses and against Aaron and the company of Korah when they strove against the Lord. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when the company died. What time the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign. I can imagine. Um, they made the ashes of themselves, didn't they? Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. The sons of Simeon, after their families, of Nemuel, the Nemuelites, and Jamin, the, the Jamanites, and Yachin, the family of the Yachinites, and Zerah, the family of the Zerites, and Shaul, the family of the Shaulites, and these are the family of the Simonites, 22,200. And then the children of Gad, after their families, of Zephon, the family of the Zephonites, and Haggai, the Haggites, and Shuni, the Shunites and Ozni, the family of Oznites, and Eri, the family of Erites, and Arad, the family of Aradites, and Arali, the family of Erlites, and these are the families of the children of Gad, according to those that were numbered of them, 40,500. Don't worry about the numbers, I'll summarize them when we get to the end of this. Then sons of Judah were Ur, Ur and Onan, and Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And behind this, of course, you may recall Judah's failure to provide the wife of Ur, a substitute husband, is what led to this tawdry episode in Genesis 38 that we've talked about many times, encrypted in which is the family tree of David in Genesis, in the Torah, surprisingly enough. But anyway, 
So much for Ur and Onan. Moving on. Then the sons of Judah, after their families were Shelah, the family of the Shelanites, and Pharez, the family of the Pharezites, and of Zerah, the family of the Zerites. And the sons of Pharez were Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, and Hamul, the family of the Hamulites. And these are the families of Judah, according to those that were numbered of them, threescore, six thousand, five hundred. And of the sons of Issachar, after their families, of Tola, the family of the Tolites, and Puah, the family of the Punites, and Jashub, the family of the Jeshubites, and Shimron, the family of the Shimronites. These are the families of Issachar, according to those that were numbered of them, threescore and four thousand, three hundred. Now, uh, before going on, I think you can appreciate the difficulties we have as we try to figure out how we're going to attack a book like this. Because on the one hand, it would be very easy to just zip through and summarize the key portions, and that has its proper place. And we do that with our summaries like Learning the Bible 24 Hours and others. On the other hand, if you really go through it verse by verse, as has been our style for 50 years, you end up, not only is it tedious for the audience sometimes, but you also end up with a product that is so bulky that it also is, isn't of practical use. It's just it's too much, if you will. So one of the difficult decisions is where do we just sort of skim through to get the summary, and where do we dig in? And, and so I'm going to take, just to show you what can be lie behind one of these names, let's just pick one. We're not, we obviously have a lot of people here, 600,000 of them. And... Uh, Let's take this guy, Tola. I pick him because he also was in the book of Judges. And he has one verse in the book of Judges. And I'm indebted to Pastor John Corson for some insights that led me down the path here, and I'll fill in the blanks here. The word Tola happens to mean scarlet. It's tra that word is translated 38 times as crimson, or its equivalent, in the scripture. Now, why does Tola mean scarlet? Because scarlet dye was made from a particular worm. The technical term is Sermus vermilio of the family of Cocosidae, which is a Thynacotta or Hemiptera. Now I know you feel much better having learned that. I feel much better having finally found that in the proper reference material. But where am I headed with this? Well, it turns out that these insects pierce the thin bark of twigs to suck the sap, from which they prepare a waxy scale to protect their soft bodies. And what happens then, the dye is in this scale. The active ingredient is cremesic acid, and the dye is one of the anthroquinones. And it, it's yellow, red in water, and becomes typically violet red in acid solution. So that's the chemistry behind this. Is that why Tola is in the scripture? H hang with me here. Do you remember in Isaiah the verse that you've heard quoted so often? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Remember that verse? The tola, while reproducing, the female climbs a tree, usually a home oak, where it bears its eggs. The larvae hatch and feed on the body of the worm. In other words, it gives its life for its mission. Okay, so far? A crimson spot, of course, is left on the branch. After three days, when the scarlet spot dries out, it changes to white and flakes off. Did you pick up on that? Jesus said from the cross, I am a worm and no man. On the tree of Calvary, so that you and I might be born again. Did you get that number of days? There's a red spot. In three days, it turns to white. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. You sort of makes you wonder, wow, what lies behind these other names? And uh, we have articles on that. Well, let's move on. Continue in Numbers 26, about verse 26. Of the sons of Zebulun, after their families, of uh, Sarah, the family of the Saradites, the Elon, the family of the Elonites, the Jalil, the family of the Jalilites, and there are, these are the families of the Zebulites, according to those that were numbered of them, three score, uh, uh, three score thousand and five hundred. And the sons of Joseph after their families were Manasseh and Ephraim. And of the sons of Manasseh, of Machir, the family of the Machirites, and Machir begot Gilead, and Gilead became the family of the Gileadites. And these are the sons of Gilead, of Jezer, the family of Jezerites, and Helak, the family of the Helakites, and 
Ezrael, the family of the Ezraelites, and, and of Shechem, and the family of Shechemites, and of Shemitah, the family of the Shemitites, and, Zeph- and Hefer, the family of the Hepherites. And there's probably a lot of other names I won't be able to pronounce properly either. But anyway, then we get to verse 33. And Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, had no sons but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza. And these are the families of Manasseh, and those were, that were numbered of them, 50 and 2,700. We're going to come back. Zelophehad also had died in the wilderness. Remember, see, everybody, all that older family, uh, older generation, passed away during those 38 years. So these daughters are now without a father. But more, the bigger problem that's hinted at here is there's no son to inherit. We're going to come back. In fact, there's a whole chapter devoted to this problem and how to deal with it. And it has some surprising implications we'll get to. These are the families of Manasseh and those that were numbered of them, 50 and 2,700. These are the sons of Ephraim, after their families, of Shuthalah and the family of the Shuthalites, and Becher and the family of the Becherites, and Tahan, the family of the Tahanites. And these are the sons of Shuthalah, of Aran, and the family of Aaronites. And these are the families of the sons of Ephraim, according to those that were numbered of them, 30 and 2,500. And these are the sons of Joseph, after their families, and Ephraim and Manasseh, obviously, being the sons of Joseph. The sons of Benjamin, after their families, of Bela, the family of the Belites, and Ashbel, the family of the Ashbelites, and At- Ahiram, the family of the Ahiramites, and Shufam, the family of the Shufamites, and Hufam, the family of the Hufamites, and sons of Bela were Ard and Naaman of Ard, and the family of Ardites, and of Naaman, the family of the Naamites. And these are the sons of Benjamin after their families. They are numbered of them were uh, 40 and 5,600. And the sons of Dan after their families were of Shuham, the family of the Shumites. And these are the families of Dan after their families. And all the families of the Shumites, according to those that were numbered of them, were three score, 4,400. Of the children of Asher, after their families, of Jimnah, the family of the Jimnites, and Jesua, the family of the Jesuits, of Beriah, the, uh, of the Berites, and the sons of Beriah, the, of Heber, the family of the Heberites, and Malchi, the family of the Malchites, and the name of the daughter of Asher was Sarah. These are the families of the sons of Asher, according to those that were numbered of them, who were 53,400. Sons of Naphtali, after their families, Jaziel, the family of Jezalites, and uh, Guni, the family of the Gunites, and Jezer, the family of the Gez- Jezerites, of Shilam, and the family of the Shilamites. And these are the families of Naphtali, according to their families, and they, they were numbered of them, 40 and 5,400. These were numbered of the children of Israel, 600,000 and 1,730. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance, according to the number of names. So we've, went, we've obviously gone through the actual list. It's always, I realize it's tedious to get through. On the one hand, at the same time, we are committed to a verse-by-verse commitment, so let's, we'll try to, from this, extract what we can. This is a summary of the numbers we've just read. And obviously, from Reuben down to, I've included Levi, who hasn't been numbered yet. He's going to be in the next few numbers, but I thought I'd give you the total, in the summary, I'll give you the total picture. We actually have um, 6,305.50 total plus the 22,000 of Levi in the first census. And uh, we have 601,730 in the second census, but we've got 23 of those were, uh, add to that 23 from Levi, which we'll get to shortly. The real point here, first of all, is that in those 28 years, Israel wasn't wiped out, wasn't hugely clobbered on the one hand. On the other hand, they also didn't prosper. They have ended up with about the same number they started, which in a sense, is an indictment because they should have been growing. But indeed, this whole era was a lost generation. They blew it at Kadesh Barnea. So 38 years later, we're restarting with a fresh group. Now, as we examine the list itself, obviously we notice right away that the ones that got diminished the most was Simeon. And we can infer, of course, uh, that was because of the uh, uh, getting uh, caught up in that idolatry and so forth. That where they were wiped out. Uh, so, and and uh, we also notice the total number is pretty much the same they started with, having uh, 820 more, or excuse me, less than uh, they started with, essentially a wash. We also notice that the largest of these, with the exception of Judah, of course, is Dan. And that's going to become very important later on because Dan is going to discover that he can't handle the land that was allocated to him which is just west of Benjamin, in the area of the Philistines. And when Samson finally dies, um, uh, they can't handle it. So they go up north. They send a, uh, a uh, 
party about 600 up north to Laish and discover an area they can take over. They take over the town and they move up north. What's really to, 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 uh, to uh, find a place for themselves? What's astonishing is that Moses predicts that they will leap from Bashan. They will leap from that area. In other words, Moses' predictions about Dan anticipate this deviation on their own part. There's a whole story, background to get behind that um, for those that you want to get, really get into it. Okay, let's continue. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, to the few thou shalt give less inheritance, to every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. So they're going to assign the regions by lot, but the, the amount of area they get within that region will be determined by their population. Notwithstanding, the land shall be divided by lot according to the names of the tribes of the fathers shall they inherit. According to the lot shall the possession thereof be divided between, between many and few. And these are they that were numbered of the Levites. And see, you know, we've, what we've numbered so far is the main camp that are the mili for military purposes to, in order to organize it. The Levites did not serve military duty. They're not numbered with the camp, but they're still numbered here afterwards. These are numbered of Levites after their families of Gershon, the family of the Gershonites, Kohath, the family of the Kohathites. That's where Moses and Aaron came from, by the way. And Merari, the family of the Merarites. These are the families of the Levites, the family of the Libanites, and the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the Mahalites, and the family of the Mushites, and the family of the Korathites, and Kohath begot Amran. And the name of Amran's wife was Jochebed, and the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt, and she bare unto Amram, and Aaron, and Moses, and Miriam the sister. Now, you get the impression from this that Amran descended from Kohath directly. That's, mis that's misleading. They didn't have terms for grandson or great-grandson. They just, if you were the son of so-and-so, the so-and-so could be any of your ancestors. Amram came from Kohath, but there's several generations. There was 400 years they were in Egypt. Okay, so you need to understand, uh, many people get, mis get confused when some of these genealogies, because it doesn't imply adjacency. In other words, biblically, I can refer to my grandfather as my father. Or well, my great grandfather is my father, so that we, we have a, a different way of reckoning that. Anyway, of Amram's wife was Jochebed, and out of that came the three Aaron, Moses, and uh, Miriam. And unto Aaron was born Adab and Abihu, which also, you may recall, had an infamous end, and Eleazar and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. You remember all that. And those that were numbered of them were twenty and three thousand, all males from a month old and upward. And they were not numbered among the children of Israel because there was no inheritance given them among the children of Israel. So they didn't inherit land. They didn't serve military duty, and they also didn't inherit land. They did get 48 cities before it's all over. But they didn't own title. Why? Because they weren't supposed to be farmers. They're supposed to be serving the Lord. That's the basic concept there. We'll talk more about that in the next session. These are they that numbered by Moses and Eliezer the priest who numbered by the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. Among these were not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered um, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord said, had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness, and there was not left a man of them save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. And so all those that were numbered in the previous census are not around anymore except Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Nun, uh, and, and Caleb. And uh, so, a lot of lessons here we could spend time on, but I'll leave that to you to reflect. Obviously, this, God means what He says and says what He means, very literally. Very, everyone, it wasn't the generation in general, it was the generation specifically. Not a man from that generation survived other than the ones that God made an exception of. And uh, so God never said, I never use the word approximate in, in God in the same sentence. He means what he says and says what he means. And uh, now we get to this strange chapter, the daughters of Zelophehad. Then came the daughter of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, and the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Zerzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah. But he died in his own sin and uh, had no sons. So the point that daughters are making is that he wasn't part of the rebellion, but he died 
because he was part of that generation. And uh, the fact that he has no sons creates a inheritance problem because the daughters obviously have no standing in, in, before the Jewish uh, form of inheritance. And so they're asking, you know, they're in effect saying, what, what's going to become of us? Why should the name of our father be done away with from among his family because he hath no son? Give us therefore a possession among the brethren of our father. Now it's interesting what Moses does. We should learn from this. He didn't jump to conclusions. He didn't give his best opinion on how to resolve this. What did he do with it? He went before the Lord. Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughter of Zelophehad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. Now how is he going to do that? Very strange way. Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And if he have no daughter, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. And if he have no brethren, then ye shall give the inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father has no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his kinsmen that is next to him of his family, and, ye shall, and he shall possess it. And it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment as the Lord commanded Moses. The Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount, Abarim, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. Now we're going to continue that story, but before we do, I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, one of the questions that you run into is, is why are some of these weird things in the Bible? You go all through the Torah especially. There's these weird rules and laws, and some of them are rather strange. And this is one of them. You say, okay, this is interesting, but why is it there? If you take the assignment of answering the question why and go to a library of commentaries, I expect that you will discover that none of them get the point. They all, when they get to this, they comment on it, well, this is just a way they dealt with it. It's just a tribal, ancient tradition. You know, they deal with it sociologically rather than recognizing that every detail in the Scripture is there deliberately by design. Every number, every place in name. That's our whole premise. Well, if that's the case, what's this all about? And I'll give you the answer you'll find before you can find it. Somehow, this is going to relate to Jesus Christ in some unique way. Now let's take a look at this one. In Jeremiah 22, 30, we discover, this is, there's been a whole bunch of kings, the northern kingdom's gone by now, the Syrians took it over, the southern kingdom have kings going from bad to worse, till you finally get to the king Jeconiah. He's also called Jehoiakim or Coniah, goes by several equivalent names. By the time you get to Jeconiah, God is so fed up with him, he pronounces a blood curse on Jeconiah. In verse 30 of chapter Jeremiah 22, Thus saith the Lord, Write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. You say, okay, God's pretty upset. Let me put this in my own vernacular. As I read this, I sort of imagine that in the councils of Satan, they had a party. I mean, they must have been convinced that God has shot himself in the foot, as we might say in our vernacular. Because God has committed himself that the Messiah is going to come from the line of David. Jeconiah is of the royal line. God has now pronounced a blood curse on the royal line. And I can just visualize Satan just great, because God has undone himself. And as I visualize that fantasy in my mind, I visualize God turning to the angel and saying, watch this one, okay? When you get to the genealogies in the New Testament, you, of course, Matthew is a Jew, he presents his genealogy of the Messiah, starting as any Jew would with Abraham, down Abram to David. Luke is a doctor and a Gentile. He's not interested in Jesus as the son of David, he's interested in him as the son of man. He's a doctor. So he starts, Luke starts his genealogy, obviously, with Adam. And from Adam to Noah, and then we go from Shem down to, and finally he gets to, he takes the, in other words, the genealogy from Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to David, they both, of course, as you would expect, are identical, right? Okay, let's take a look at David. When Matthew takes David, he goes through the first surviving son of Bathsheba, 
who was named Jedediah uh, by Nathan, but then called Solomon. He's the king, we all know King Solomon. And it goes down through Jehoiakim. And then we get to the cursed line, Jehoiakim, down through Joseph, who is the legal father, but not the blood father of Jesus Christ. So he is not subject to the blood curse of Jeconiah because he's not born of that line. What does Luke do? When he gets to, he, up till David, they're identical. But when, when he gets to David, Luke does a strange thing. He takes a left turn and goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, a guy by the name of Nathan, not Nathan the prophet, different Nathan. And if you go through this, he comes down to Heli, who is the father of Mary. So you have, God had promised David that the Messiah would be of the house and lineage of David. He's of the house legally because of Joseph, and he's of the lineage through Mary. So this, God was able to curse Jeconiah because he had already predetermined that Jesus would be born of a virgin. The virgin birth is an end run on the curse of Jeconiah. How can it be? Only because of the exception in the law given to the daughters of Zelophehad. Of all the commentaries I've studied in 50 years, only one guy perceived this. You won't find it in his famous Bible, the Schofield Bible, but you'll find it in Schofield Notes. He was the one that recognized that the claims of Christ hang on this strange exception in the Torah. The daughter of Zelophehad. The exception was requested of Moses in Numbers 27. When we get to Joshua, the daughters come to him, and Joshua checks the record. He's right, Joshua 17, he grants it. What most people don't understand unless you've dug into this is the way they implemented the procedure in the Torah is that when the bride had no brothers, the father of the bride adopted the husband of the bride as his son. And that's in uh, Ezra 2, uh, Nehemiah 7, Numbers 32, it comes up, and First Chronicles 2 and elsewhere. So this whole thing anticipates the lineage of Christ. When you look at Luke 3.23 in the Greek, you'll discover that Joseph was the son-in-law, as we would translate it, of Heli. The word is nomizo, reckoned as by law. And that's, uh, most people, it's amazing how many Bible helps don't recognize that Luke's genealogy is of Mary, not Joseph. And uh, anyway, so the virgin birth, it was hinted at in the Garden of Eden, the seed of the woman, it was prophesied. Um, in Isaiah 7.14, we, as we remind ourselves every Christmas. And of course, it's the end run of the blood curse on Jeconiah. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And uh, the Word, that, that Jesus was the Word incarnate. John uses that as his title, not only in the, in the, the opening session of, of his Gospel, but also the book of Revelation. We have... Uh, and we could go through the whole organization of the four Gospels. We see the presentation of the Messiah quadraphonically, if you will, from four different points of view, as the Messiah is the suffering servant, the Son of Man, or the Son of God, by the four different, and so forth. And we went through this when we talked about the four camps and their ensigns, just by way of review. So let's just move on now. Okay, Numbers 27, verse 12, change the subject now. The Lord said unto Moses, get thee up into this Mount Abarim, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. So Moses gets to not go in, but see the land from a, a mountain peak. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. And for ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes, that is the water of Meribah at Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. So Moses, as, you, as we reviewed, blew it, and for that reason he does not to get not get to enter in. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, let the, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go up before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep that have no shepherd. The Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. And set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. Give him a charge in their sight. Notice this next very carefully. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He didn't say all. It's interesting. Joshua takes over. He's going to run, uh, not just general of the army, but, but take Moses' place. But he does no miracles. Moses had one miracle after another. Joshua doesn't. 
And Joshua doesn't talk to the Lord directly. Joshua learns what the Lord's will is through the priesthood and its, and its various uh, procedures. So Joshua has some of the honor, but doesn't replace Moses. No one can replace Moses. And he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word they shall go out, at his word they shall come in, but both he and the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. So Joshua's in charge, but he's going to get the instruction about what God's intentions are from the priest. Different procedure. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation. He laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as God commanded by the hand of Moses. Okay, so now we get into a chapter that's going to deal with, among other things, the spring feasts. There's two chapters on the feasts. There's three in the first month and three in the seventh. We'll take each three. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, My offering and my bread for my sacrifice, made by fire for a sweet savor unto me, shall ye observe to offer unto me in, do, in their due season. We're going to now see an emphasis on the offerings. We're not going to spend a lot of time trying to uh, ra unravel the structure of those offerings. We did that in the book of Leviticus. But here we, uh, you'll find the primary purpose of the text is to highlight the mechanics of those offerings. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord, two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day, for a continual burnt offering. Every day, a daily offering. When we were in Leviticus, you remember there's voluntary offerings, the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offerings. These are offerings to God, the sweet savor. These are voluntary. The compulsory ones, non-sweet savior, that's, that's offerings made for us, the sin offering and the trespass offering. These are categories that have differences that we won't uh, uh, try to deal with in this, in this review. One lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, the other thou shalt offer it even in the tenth part of the ephah of flour for a meat offering mingled with the fourth part of him uh, and uh, him beat, uh, beaten oil. And it's a continual burnt offering which was ordained in Mount Sinai for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. You know, these, these uh, details here are for a lot of different reasons. Obviously, details for them, so they'll do it properly. But it's also a testimony of their commitment to God. It's also his way of communicating to them they're going to be prosperous enough to fulfill these offerings. And these are going to be enormous by the time you get through. It's, it's going to require a fairly substantial um, and prosperity on the part of the nations, we'll see, which is fine. He, the Lord will provide that. And the drink offering thereof shall be a fourth part of a hen for, of, of the one lamb, and in the holy place thou shalt cause a strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. And the other lamb shalt thou offer at evening as, a meat offering in the mor uh, as the meat offering of the morning, and as the drink offering thereof thou shalt offer it a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor of the Lord. And on the Sabbath day, this is the only place the offerings, we've talked about Sabbath days before, but here in Numbers where you have the offerings that are uh, required. On the Sabbath day, two lambs of the first year without spot to two, and two-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and the drink thereof. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And in the beginnings of your months, ye you shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot. Now something else you notice here and in the beginnings of your months, they're on a lunar calendar. The big thing in Judaism is to identify the new moon. They have a whole procedure. They watch from the roof for the new moons. And these are sacred festivals. They are not possessing the character of solemn feasts, but they were distinguishing by the following things. The blowing of trumpets over these sacrifices, Numbers 10. The suspension of all labor except domestic occupations of women in Amos 8.5 the celebration of public worship and social and family feasts. These are the new moons. The temple in the millennium, when it's built, will be open only on Shabbat, not on Sunday, and it will also be open on new moons. The new moons and Shabbat procedure in the millennium will be reinstituted in Christ's kingdom. And so these, these are not prescribed in the law, but they came, became uh, practice subsequently. Verse 12, the three-tenth deals of flour for meat offering mingled with oil, one bullock, two-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil, one ram, several tenth deal of flour mingled with oil for a meat offering unto one lamb for a burnt offering of the sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire of the Lord. And their drink offering shall be half a hen and wine of a bullock, and a third part of a hen unto a ram, and the fourth part of a hen unto a lamb. This is the burnt offering of every month throughout the months of the year. So these are all monthly, these in addition to the ones every week. 
the one kid of the goats. You see, we've had a daily one, we have a weekly one, and now these are every month. And uh, one kid of the goats for his sin offering unto the Lord shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And in the 14th day of the first month is the Passover. Now we're dealing with the first of the seven feasts of Israel. These are detailed for you in Leviticus 23 and other places, but this 14th day. Now, we have three feasts in the first month of the year, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. And every one of these feasts, Paul tells us, are uh, a shadow of things to come. So they're not only commemorative historically, for good reason, they are also prophetic. And each one of these, first, uh, each one of these feasts in the spring, the first three of the seven, speak of the first coming of Jesus Christ. And, uh, we'll, we'll, and we're going to have, after these, we'll have three in the seventh month. And all three of these, most scholars believe, relate in some way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then there's a strange one in the seven feasts of Israel that are not mentioned here in Numbers. And we'll talk about that before we finish. Let's take a look at the spring feasts. Passover, of course, the Passover lamb was examined on the 10th of Nisan. And Jesus rode his donkey into Jerusalem to be examined on the 10th of Nisan. And the Passover was offered between the evenings of, between the, uh, uh, the evening of the 14th. Friday the 13th on the Egyptian calendar is unlucky because of that reason. You ever wonder why Friday the 13th is unlucky? It goes back to the Passover in Egypt. It's interesting that three or different places in the scripture it mentions regarding Passover that not a bone was to be broken. And how fascinating it is that a committed career Roman soldier violated his orders and not, did not break the legs of that one particular one crucified. John the Baptist, when he first introduces Jesus Christ publicly in John chapter 1, says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Jewish title. He does that twice, first two days, and, and the next day he does the same thing. Jesus was identified as the Passover Lamb from the very beginning. The crucifixion of Christ was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. He was our Passover. Following Passover, we could spend a whole evening on Passover details, but let's move on. The next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the ha Hamatzah. Leaven, of course, is a symbol of sin. The idea of unleavened bread is, to be, is the removal of sin. In the Passover procedure, there are three matzahs, even to, even to this day. The one in the middle is broken and hidden, and they search for it as part of a little procedure in the family. The whole idea of the unleavened bread, the, the, whole, the wine and the bread idioms, show up not only in Passover, they start with Joseph, the baker and the wine steward. And there are four cups in a proper Passover feast. And it's interesting, the, the, it, it's the cup of blessing, the third of the fourth, that Jesus introduces the Lord's Supper and then declares he will not taste the fruit of the vine until we're all together in, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, in effect. And it's interesting, the fourth cup was not taken. The, the Lord's Supper was an unfinished meal, yet to be completed. This cup of blessing, Paul calls it, and goes on to talk about the institution of it. Anyway, uh, Numbers, verse 17, on the 15th day of this month, that's the day after Passover, is the feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as we call it. Seven days shall, be, uh, shall the unleavened bread be eaten. So this is a seven-day feast, not a one day like the others. There are two of these. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the spring and the Feast of Sukkot that we're going through right now. In the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no manner of servile work therein, but you shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks and one ram and seven lambs of the first year, and they shall be unto you without blemish. Notice the emphasis. God always gets the best, not the, hand, not the hand-me-downs, not the ones you're ready to discard for obsolescence. He gets the best, the newest, and so forth. That's the whole concept that's emphasized here. And their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil. Three-tenth deal shall you offer for a bullock. Two-tenth deals for a ram. The seventh-tenth deal shall be thou offer for every lamb throughout the seven lambs. And one goat for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. You shall offer these beside the burnt offering in the morning, which is for a continual burnt offering. And after this manner shall you offer daily throughout the seven days the meat of the sacrifice made by fire and the sweet savor unto the Lord. It shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And on the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation and shall do no servile work. So that's the seven day pre presentation there. Now we get to a strange holiday or feast that is widely misunderstood by most Gentile commentators. And you want to go very, very carefully to see what the Scripture really says. In Leviticus 23, verse 11, it's defined, it's the moral, the morning, after Shabbat, 
after Passover. You realize that Passover, being on the 14th of Abib or, or Nisan, can be any day of the week, depending on what year you're talking about. It's on the 14th. That could be, turns out, be unconnected to the day of the week. But following it will be a Shabbat, a Saturday. The next morning is when they have the Feast of First Fruits. It's very ironic, there's a big debate between the Samaritans and the Jews, and the Samaritans, are, this was their view, the Jews have a slightly different way of reckoning it. Not, that's not the scriptural way of doing it, by the way, interestingly enough. What does this always mean? It means it's always on a Sunday morning. And one Sunday morning, when there was the smoke of the Feast of First Fruits offerings going up from the temple, a group of women were discovering an empty tomb. This was fulfilled. The first fruits was fulfilled on the day it's observed. Every one of these prophetic fulfillments are on the day it's observed. Passover, the Passover Christ occurred on Passover. The Feast of First Fruits happened on that Sunday morning, three days later, and so forth. The morning of the ultimate first fruits, Jesus Christ. One of the questions I love to ask when we go through Genesis is when did the flood of Noah end? Everybody knows when it started. When did it end? And Genesis 8, 4 says, The ark rested in the seventh month of the, on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And if you're a normal, you know, well-adjusted person, you continue reading that. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you are no longer a normal, well-adjusted person. You say to yourself, gee, God, Chuck said that, the, that the, nothing's in here by accident. The Holy, why did the Holy Spirit want me to know that the ark came to rest on the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month? Who cares? That was a long time ago. What's hidden behind this? There's always a treasure for the diligent. Now it turns out that the Holy Spirit wanted to know this very date. wonder why. Well, understand the Jews have two calendars. They have a civil calendar, Tishri, which is the first month of the civil calendar. That's in the fall. The first of Tishri is Rosh Hashanah, their new year. Don't let Rosh Hashanah confuse you with the Feast of Trumpets, which also occurs on that day, but it's a religious year. This is the, Rosh Hashanah is technically a civil issue. The religious calendar starts in the spring, the month of Nisan or Abib. In Exodus 12, when the Passover is instituted to Moses in Egypt, it says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So if Tishri is the first month, Nisan is the seventh month, it turns out. That's on the old calendar, the, what I'll call the Genesis calendar. The new calendar instituted in Exodus is that Nisan becomes the first month, which makes Tishri, guess what? The seventh month, right? But the reference in Genesis 8, 4 is on the Genesis calendar. Okay, where are we then? Well, Jesus is crucified on the 14th of Nisan. How long was he in the grave? Anyone? Three days. So if he's in the grave, then he was resurrected on when? 17th. Now that's, Nisan was the seventh month of the Genesis calendar. Now let's connect all these dots. If the ark came to rest, in other words, the flood is over, the new beginning for Noah starts on the 17th day of the seventh month. So Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth was on the anniversary in anticipation of our new beginning in Christ. What a coincidence. Now you don't have to remember all these details, but what you want to come away with is to realize that God has a plan. And that plan was designed before you and I were born. He had his mind on you before you were born. Ephesians 1 4 says, be you, that he, be before the foundation of the world, right? So God is, there's no surprises. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen, He knows what your needs are. And uh, it's, it, we're all part of His plan of redemption. Amen is right. Praise God. Do I hear an amen? amen. All right, good. You've got to get a little more old fashioned. That's a good, that's a good thing. That's a, Okay, verse 26, and on the, in the day of the first fruits, when you bring new meat offering unto the Lord after, four, after your week shall be out, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no ser servile work, but you shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord, two young bullocks, one ram, seven lambs of the first year, and the meat offering, flour mingled with oil, t three tenth deals of one bullock, unto one bullock, two tenth deals unto one ram, and the seventh tenth deal to one lamb, and throw out these seven lambs, and one kid of the goats to make atonement for you. You shall offer them beside the continual burnt offering, and his meat offering, they shall be unto you without rubbish. There again, the best, and their drink offerings. So those, that's a quick summary of the, the offerings that are required for the spring feast. Numbers 29 deals with the fall feasts. And uh, remember we have three in the first, in, in the, in the month, first month, 
These other three will all occur in the seventh month, the month of Tishri. Uh, first shall be last, the last shall be first, I guess. I'm very in, in, interesting. So the first of these is Yom Teruah, or what we call the Feast of Trumpets. It's not the first of Tishri. It co-occurs with Rosh Hashanah, but for different reasons. But they are on the same day. And uh, so we'll take a look at these, Yom Teruah. It's coincident with, of course, the, the, the New Year in the civil sense. It includes the, the great blowing. And some people confuse or believe it's tied to the last trump. It may or may not be. Certainly don't confuse it with the seventh trumpet judgment revelation. They got nothing, one has nothing to do with the other. Um, followed, they're, different, they're different trumpets, by the way, and all that. I won't go down to all that here. We'll keep moving. It is followed by ten days of awe, the Yomim Norim, the ten days of affliction. These are days that, of reflection, the, the getting ready for the most solemn feast of the year, Yom Kippur. But in Numbers, the first few verses, number 29, the seventh month, the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile our work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. And you shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And the meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil and uh, three-tenth deals for a bullock and two-tenth deals for a ram. It goes on. Um, notice that this trumpet, Blowing the trumpets unto you, that's under Israel. Don't confuse Israel and the church. One of, your, one of the most fundamental things to be sensitive to in your scriptural studies. But moving on, one-tenth deal for the lamb, throw out seven lambs, one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you, beside the burnt offering of the month and its meat offering and the daily burnt offerings and its meat offering and their drink offerings according to their, according to their manner for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall have the tenth day of this seventh month, a holy convocation. The tenth day of the month of Tishri is Yom Kippur. It's the day of atonement. And you shall, uh, you shall afflict your souls. You shall not do any work therein. It doesn't say servile work, any work. This is much more specific and strong than the other commandments. But you shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord for a sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, seven lambs of the first year. They shall be unto you without blemish, and their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil, three-tenth deals to a bullock, two-tenth deals to one ram, and a several, and several tenth deal for one lamb throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering beside the sin offering of atonement, and the continual burnt offering, and the meat offering of it, and their drink offerings. You say, gee, you're getting an awful lot of blood here. Absolutely, that's the point. God wants us to understand that sin has a price. A very, very serious price, and he takes it very seriously. Yom Kippur, the tenth of Tishri. It's a day of national repentance, obviously. This is the day and the only day that the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies. Many people don't realize that. Only the high priest can go in there and only once a, day, once a year and only after great ceremonial preparation. This is also the day they have the two goats. They choose which one's going to play which role. By, they're both without blemish, obviously. They draw lots and the one is offered to the Lord and the other one, the high priest lays his hand on his head put all the sins of Israel on that, and he is led out by an able fit man into the wilderness um, to, to the, those sins are gone is the idea. It's called, he's called Azazel. And uh, there, is, there are many traditions that make Azazel really the title of Satan. It's a name. It's come to mean scapegoat because of the role here. Now what apparently happened, they did this for quite a few years, and one year the goat somehow found its way back to camp. And that was deemed a very serious omen. So from, they made, from that day on, when they led the, the uh, scapegoat out into the wilderness, they took him to a cliff and made sure he got killed. And uh, what there also is a tell, uh, uh, un, uh, an understanding. Before they did that, before they, uh, they uh, led him away, they, had a, they tied a red cord around his neck and to the door of the temple. And then they'd cut the cord and the able fit man would lead him off to his destiny. When the goat went off the cliff and died, the remainder of the cord around the temple would turn white. And that happened, apparently, for many, many years. In the Talmud of all places, in Yoma 39b, if you read that, there's, they're disturbed because they notice that 40 years before the temple was destroyed, that cord no longer turned white. And they're all upset about it. Something is wrong because the Israel's sins are not being dealt with because that cord doesn't turn white like it used to. That's basically the gist of that passage. What happened 40 years before the temple was destroyed? Jesus was crucified. 
and the temple veil was torn. Now what's astonishing is that in the writings of the Talmud themselves, which you certainly wouldn't consider our friends, so to speak, in the, as a Christian point of view, they document this paradigm, interestingly enough. But we'll move on. The last feast of the year is Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, or as it's commonly called, the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th of Tishri, which happens to be today when we're having the study. Now, it started last night. And uh, let's read what it says, and then I'll give you some other background. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles commonly. And what they do for a week, this is a week-long celebration, they build a, a structure in their backyard uh, called booths, and technically what is believed they're supposed to be doing is that you're supposed to be able to see the stars through the roof, and the wind's supposed to be able to blow through the walls, the intention uh, being to uh, replicate their experience while wandering in the wilderness, that 38 years. So they simulate that by camping out in their backyard with a structure, and along with some ceremonies. But the point is, at the end of this celebration, they return to the permanent dwellings. So many people in this see an, an idiom of maybe the resurrection. But uh, what is astonishing to note, I was really quite surprised to discover this recently, is that Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 17 records the fact that they failed to observe this from Joshua unto the days of Nehemiah. In other words, you were in Numbers, that's before Joshua takes over and they enter the land. They apparently, despite all this teaching, failed to observe Sukkot all through the, the, the years of uh, David, Solomon, etc., because Nehemiah comes after the return from Babylon's captivity. And verse 17, it records that they, they had failed to keep this. It's astonishing when you get to Joshua, you discover that the 38 years in the wilderness, they didn't circumcise their kids. The first thing Joshua has to do in the, at Gilgal is to circumcise all the males, because they hadn't, despite all the teaching, despite all, they, they didn't follow these things. So, surprising. Here, the, what Numbers talks about uh, Sukkot, the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work, you shall keep a feast on the Lord seven days, and you shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord, 13 young bullocks, two rams, 14 lambs of the first year, and they shall be without blemish. Their meat offering shall be a flour mingled with oil, three tenth deals unto the, every bullock, and 13 bullocks, two tenth deals to each ram of two rams, and se several tenth deal to each lamb of the 14 lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering, beside this continual burnt offering, his he, uh, his meat offering and his drink offering. Then on the second day, same deal. We go right through it, the same deal on the second day. Third day, same deal. Oh, excuse me. Um, each time, there, each time it's, it's less. Okay. The fourth day, there'll be 10 bullocks and 14 lambs of the first year without blemish. The fifth day, there'll be nine bullocks. See, it's a countdown, the number of bullocks. Uh, two rams, 14 lambs of the first year without spot, their meat offering, and so forth. On the sixth day, there'll be eight bullocks, and all the rest is the same. Seventh day, there are seven bullocks. See, it's, it's counting right on down. And then uh, on the eighth day, they shall have, uh, you shall have, now the eighth day, it's the big close. They've had, they had seven yesterday. Now the, the eighth day, you shall have a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. You can do work, but not, not work that is for remuneration, so to speak. But ye shall offer a burnt offering, a sacrifice made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord, one bullock, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without blemish, their meat offering and the drink offerings for the bullock, the ram, and for the lamb shall be according to their number. And one goat for the sin offering, beside the continual burnt offering, is meat offering and drink offering. These things shall you do unto the Lord in your set feast, beside your vows and your free will offerings, and for your burnt offerings, and for your meat offerings, and for your drink offerings, and for your peace offerings. And Moses told the children of Israel according to all that Lord commanded Moses. Now, um, and, and, there, and there we have the uh, Sukkot. I might mention something that's also associated with Sukkot, and that's the lulav. And uh, this is a lulav flown in from Jerusalem for this occasion, in effect. And it consists of four elements, a palm, fr a fr a palm branch, it, and uh, the palm branch, is, according to Psalm 92, is regarded to re relate to the righteous because it's straight. See, it's, that's the concept there. Uh, the etrog is the second element. This is an etrog. You and I might consider it a super lemon, in effect. Very fragrant, very, very much desired uh, uh, fruit, the etrog. And uh, it, it, it speaks of glory and majesty in the positive sense. 
And it speaks of pride and arrogance in the negative sense. Many who get caught up in their own glory and majesty get hung up by pride and arrogance. And the term, it's used rabbinically in those ways. Reference there is Psalm 104. Then the other elements of the, of the, of the uh, lulav is the myrtle. And uh, we have the myrtle here. And uh, the reference there, and it alludes to the Messiah, surprisingly enough. And the first two chapters of Zechariah are the references here. And the last one, it's not a very good one in here, is the willow. And uh, its reference is uh, Psalm 68.4. Another aspect that's been observed of these four elements of the lulav is the palm has, has fruit, the date palm has fruit, but no smell. The etrog has, is both fruit and has a smell. The myrtle has smell, but no fruit. And so the willow has no fruit no, or any smell. So all of us are included here, one way or the other, in effect. But let's move on. So we have the spring feasts we mentioned in the previous chapter. We have the fall feasts mentioned here. Let me insert something that's astonishing to me to find missing altogether. It's not mentioned in the book of Numbers at all. And that's the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And I was really quite surprised to see it missing here. And uh, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Shavuot. At the Feast of First Fruits, they start counting what they call the, uh, counting the Omer, 49 days. And incidentally, it's the only use of leavened bread in the Bible that makes it quite distinctive. That also gives it a Gentile complexion. The question about Feast of Shavuot, it means many things, but in terms of its prophetic role, it, of course, is fulfilled in Acts 2. On the Feast of Shavuot is when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. There is some speculation that it also might be only half fulfilled, that the gathering of the church, it was born in a miracle in Acts, in Acts chapter 2, it'll be gathered in a miracle, according to 1 Thessalonians 4 and other passages. And so there are some that speculate that maybe it's God's plan to gather the church on its birthday. Why do they say that? Because of the Enoch traditions. Enoch was translated. There are three groups of people that faced the flood of Noah. Those that perished the flood, those that were preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior to the flood, namely Enoch. And they have a tradition in Judaism that Enoch was born uh, on the day they observe Feast of Shavuot. And they also have a tradition that he was translated on his birthday. Well, if you connect those dots, and that, that's a big if, but if you connect those dots, that would imply that the church might be translated on its birthday. So I leave that with you, and we'll move on to Numbers 30, which is just a short little thing here about vows. Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Now, wouldn't that be neat if that was true, like it used to be? There was an ethic in business. My word is my bond. Even men who are not born again, people who might be immoral in a sexual or, sexual or some other way, had a reputation for keeping their word as what made, the, made, made the, uh, the, the nation work. And how tragic it is that that has evaporated. But in any case, this goes on about, now focus on women. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, she'll keep it. And her father hear her vow and, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. In other words, women are supposed to keep their vows too, and if she's married and her husband overhears it and doesn't object, she's bound to that vow to be done. God's main point, God never asks us to take a vow, but he expects us to take one to keep it. But notice this interesting exception, verse 5. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth it, not any of her vows nor of her bonds wherewith she hath bound, uh, hath bound her soul shall stand. The Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed it. In other words, if a woman creates a vow and her husband objects, she's not bound to it. But he's got to object when he first hears it. He can't do it later. You follow me? That's the, that's the concept that's being expressed here. If she, had all, if she had it all a husband when she vowed and uttered out of her lips wherewith she bound her soul and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vows shall stand and her bonds wherewith she bound her, uh, she bound her soul shall stand. 
How interesting. See, again, it's the idea that the man is accountable. And the wife's accountable to the man, too. And if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. But every vow of a widow, and of her that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their souls, shall stand against her. In other words, they're on their own, they're expected to keep their word. If she vowed in her husband's house, or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it, and held his peace at her, and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. And if her husband hath utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows, or concerning the bond of her soul, shall not stand. Her husband hath made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. Every vow, and every binding oath to afflict her soul, her husband may establish it, or her husband may make it void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he establishes all her vows and all her bonds which are upon her. He confirmeth them because he held his peace at her in the day that he heard them. But if he shall anyways make them void after that he hath heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. Ooh. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between man and his wife, between father and his daughter, being yet in her youth in her father's house. Okay, uh, Vengeance on the Midianites. Numbers 31. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. So this is Moses' last official act. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. And of every tribe, a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye, shall ye send to the war. Now this, of course, is all in response to Midian, the uh, Midianites' apostate, uh, uh, or leading Israel into apostate uh, episodes at Baal Peor. Remember, that, that's what Balaam had counseled Balak to organize, and that's what they did. And so God is angry, and they're going to take vengeance. Now the Midianites are very large and very powerful people. Moses is following the Lord's instruction to send 12,000. 1,000 from each tribe. You've got a team here of 12,000 going against who knows how many. It's going to be quite an episode. So there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel. How many thousands? 600,000. Out of 600,000, we're going to take 12,000 and send them on this mission. So were they delivered out of the thousands of Israel, 1,000 of every tribe, 12,000 armed for war. And guess who's leading them? This one's interesting. Moses sent them into war, a thousand of every tribe, them, and guess who? Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to the war, with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. This is a holy war. The fact that Phinehas is there at all as a priest is a surprise. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and guess what? They slew all the males. Wow. Wow. They slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Erechim, and Zur, and Hur, and Reba, and the five kings of Midian. Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. He'd gone home, but he apparently had come back to involve himself again with these, and he got what he deserved. This irresponsible servant was finally slain, Balaam, the son of Beor. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of their, ca uh, of their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. And they burned all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their goodly castles with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey, both men and the beasts. They brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eliezer the priest and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp, the plains of Moab, which were by Jordan near Jericho. And Moses and Eliezer the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp, and they are upset, as you will find out. Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains of the thousands and the captains of the hundreds, which came for the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? I may shock you, but see, his attitude is, it was the Midianites used their women to deliberately lead Israel into idolatry. So the women were their instruments of Israel's undoing. So Moses is shocked that they kept them alive. 
Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. This is most, you, have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Beor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. But all the women, children that have not, all the women, children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. So they keep the virgins, they kill the rest. And do ye abide without the camp seven days? Whosoever hath killed any person, and whosoever hath touched any slain, purify both yourselves and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. And purify all your raiment that is made of skins, and your work of your goat's hair, and all things made of wood. Now the age of the priest said of the man of war which went into battle, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron, the tin, and the lead, and everything that may abide the fire, ye shall make it go through the fire, that it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation, and all that abideth not the fire shall make go through the water. And ye shall wash your clothes on the seventh day, and ye shall be clean. Afterward, ye shall come into the camp. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the sum of the prey that was taken, both of man and beast, thou and Eliezer the priest, and the chief fathers of the congregation, and divide the prey into two parts, between them that took the war upon them, and who went out into battle, and between all the congregation. Now I'll show you a chart that will break this down for you, so don't worry about the details. And levy a tribute unto the Lord of the men of war which went out to battle, one soul of five hundred, both of persons and of beeves and of asses and of sheep. Take it of their half and give it unto Eliezer the priest for a heave offering unto the Lord. And of the children of Israel's half, thou shalt take one portion of fifty of the persons of the beeves, the asses, and the flocks, and all manner of beasts, and give that unto the Levites, which keep the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. And Moses and Eliezer and the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. The booty, being the rest of the prey which the men of war caught, was six hundred thousand and seventy thousand and five thousand sheep, threescore and twelve thousand beeves, and threescore and one thousand asses, and thirty and two thousand persons and, all, and all, persons and all of women that had not known man lying with him. And the half, which was the portion of them that went out to war, was in the number of 300,000, 730,000, and 500 sheep. And the Lord's tribute of the sheep was 600 and threescore and 15, and the bees were 36,000, which the Lord's tribute was threescore and 12. And here's, the, here's what this is all, some, all about. The total amount of sheep was 675,000. Half of it was given to the 12,000 that actually pulled off. By the way, uh, I forgot to emphasize something else. After this war, how many of the 12,000 were killed? Zero. They didn't have one casualty, and they wiped out the Midianites 100%. The Lord's hand was in this. Well, the 12,000, the soldiers were the 12,000. They get the 337,000 sheep and, the, and all the rest of that. They, t they take off uh, 675, one out of 1,000, so to speak, for the, the Lord. Um, they take uh, the, the, half went to the soldiers, half went to the camp, and they also take off 10% for the Levites. In other words, they split it between the soldiers and the, and the uh, camp. They take 10% for the Levites, and 10% of what the Levites get goes to God. So that's, those are the numbers, to give you a feeling for it. And the asses were 30,500, the Lord's tribute, and so forth. Of the person, 16,000, which the Lord's tribute was 32. And it goes through to summarize that chart. The, the, the Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering unto Eliezer, the priest, and the Lord commanded Moses, and the, and the children of Israel's half, which Moses divided from the men that were... Now the half that pertained unto the congregation was 300,000, 30,000, 7,500 sheep, and 36,000 beeves, and so forth. These are just, this is just the background for this chart. And even the children of Israel's half, Moses took one portion of the 50, both the man and beast, and gave them to the Levites, which was kept. Now by the way, they split this that way. David did it differently. David, in, in, in 1 Samuel, he sets it up so that those, the, those that didn't go to war, that were back at headquarters in the support roles, also participated in the booty. He had a whole different approach that David used. But anyway, the officers that were over the thousands of the hosts, the captains of the thousands, the captains of the hundreds, came near to Moses. They said to Moses, Thy servants have taken the sum of the men of war which were under our charge. There lacketh not one man of us. In other words, they didn't lose a single guy. We have therefore brought an oblation for the Lord, what every man hath gotten of good jewels and gold and chains and bracelets and rings, earrings and tablets, to make an atonement for our sins. In other words, they're so taken by the fact that they have a miraculous... Um, performance here that it's obviously the Lord's doing so they're giving of theirs to the Lord in honor of that. Moses and Eliezer the priest took the gold of them and even all the wrought jewels 
and all the gold offering that they offered to the Lord of the captains of the thousands of the captains of the hundreds and the 16,750 shekels. For the men of war had taken spoil every man for himself. And Moses and Eliezer the priest took the gold of the captains of the thousands and the hundreds and brought it to the tabernacle for a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord. Okay, so that wraps up our study for tonight. For next time, which is our final session, you read Numbers 32 through 36. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to, to try to figure out. In, the, in, the, the, in those chapters, you'll discover the cities of refuge. Very quaint procedure to distinguish between uh, manslaughter and premedicated murder. And, and, and uh, you have this strange procedure. What does that procedure, how does that apply to us today? It's a very strange procedure. What lessons can you learn from the peculiar lessons from the city of refuge? Something else you might do in preparation for our final review, you might make a list of the major types that we've encountered in the book of Judges. We've had the manna, we've had the brazen serpent, we've had a handful of these. Now make a list of the ones that you can remember. And that will be your assignment for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being able to open your word and read it without interference, that we can meet like this peaceably. And Father, we also thank you for these types that we find, these foreshadowings that we find in your word. Father, we would ask that you would help us understand your purposes, and your plan as you've revealed it. We thank you, Father, that your, our calendar is our catechism. Father, we pray that you would help us understand <clears throat> the lessons of the seven feasts, that we would understand what you have intended behind these strange ordinances that we might behold you, that we might better understand what you would have of us in the days that remain. We thank you, Father, that for us, Jesus Christ is our fulfillment of all these things, that he is indeed our Passover. He indeed is our Shabbat. He indeed is all these things. And yet, Father, we would also ask you through your Holy Spirit, to increase our understanding of these things, that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of him with whom we have to do, that we might more, be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that lie ahead. As we commit this evening and ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.